Once again, good morning, and welcome to Changi Baptist Church. I like to I like to say this: that we are always glad that we have chosen this place to worship and to honor the Lord. If you are new in this church, we would like to thank you for worshiping with us, and we warmly welcome you into Changi Baptist Church as our brothers and our sisters. Let us pray. Dear Abba Father, as we gather here in this century, we want to give our praises with our thankful heart. We thank you for you. You are with us. You are our God. You will strengthen us. You will help us and help uphold us. You call us to come to you and lay our burdens and fears at your feet. We thank you for your faithfulness and your promises. In Jesus' name, amen. 
This morning, we're going to do um, scripture reading, and please turn to your hymna at page 713. We shall read together Psalm 1 to 1. Let's read together Psalm 1 to 1. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot sleep. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches our Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is our shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Thank you, Lord. You know, this is the promise, and this is what we should remember and not be discouraged when we are facing our challenges. So let us rise. And we'll sing song one.
holy forever. We know that our Lord name is the highest. His name is the greatest. All thrones and dominance, all powers and position. His name stand above them all. rise
invite our brother Johnny to lead us our corporate prayer. Shall we all uh, rise, please? And let us go before the Lord together. Dear Abba, Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, hello be your name, and we love you. As we gather and bow down before your very holy presence this new morning, again we want to acknowledge that you are our Lord God Almighty, who is sovereign in every details of our lives. Yes, Lord, we are yours, and there is none beside you. This morning, we also come to acknowledge, we want to repent and confess before you that indeed, Lord, we are sinful, weak people. And for the times that we sin against you, grieve you and disobey you, we are sorry. We come to seek your forgiveness, your cleansing, your restoration, your help and your empowerment each day to overcome. For each, every new morning, Lord, we are grateful and thankful for your amazing love, grace and mercy you reign into our lives. For your blessed assurance that you are with us, your provision of all our daily needs and your shalom, shalom that is upon all of us here. Yes, Holy Spirit, thank you for going ahead of us each day. Please deliver us from the evil one. Keep us safe, strong, healthy and faithful under the shadow of your almighty wings of protection for each new day. This morning, we also want to submit to you our intercession for your church, Lord. We cry to you for your calling of someone among us to rise up, to lead your church as head of the mission ministry. For it is our heart's desire, Lord, to grow and strengthen this ministry. For this, we remember to bring before you our missionaries in the field. We remember Hatis, Bodhi, and the two children in India. Your missionary field worker, please, Lord, watch over them, protect them, keep them in good health, and encourage them as they reach out for you to honor you and to glorify your name. We also stand before you this morning and submit to you our intercession for our families, members, and loved ones who are still not safe, Lord. We cry to you for their salvation too. Please, Lord, remember the name of each and every one that we have brought before you. For your grace is sufficient to save each and every one. And also for those in our midst who are sick and not well, injured, we ask for mercy and healing for each and every one who cry out to you in your name. This morning, we also submit to you our pastor, Kok Kok Seng, as he bring your words to us. May you anoint his lips with wisdom and discernment. And above all, Lord, grant him rest, strength, Lord, as he serve you faithfully to teach us, to visit us, Pastor O.K., we thank you for his faithfulness. We also ask for your blessing and protection be upon his wife and his daughter too. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer, for we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's remain standing as we sing our preparatory hymns.
scripture reading for today is taken from 1 Peter 1, 13 to 21. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it is not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised you from the dead and glorified him. Uh, raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. May God bless the reading of his word. Good morning, church. So we have started with. Uh reading of uh, 1 Peter last week, and uh, this week we will continue um, with uh, today's uh, passage, n- namely verses 13 to 21, and I'll focus uh, mainly on verses uh, 13 to uh, 16. So, if you're new, if you're new to the study of 1 Peter, or if uh, last week you weren't with us here, um, here's a quick background to this letter. It was written by the Apostle Peter, one of Jesus' uh, original 12 in 64 AD. It was written against the backdrop of some of the worst persecution of Christians under Roman rule uh, between 64 AD to 67 uh, AD. That was the period of uh, greatest uh, extreme persecution. Emperor Nero blamed the Christians for the great fire of Rome. Three quarter, about three quarter of Rome was actually burned down. And a historian said that he did it, yeah? But he said the Christian did it. He pinned the blame onto the Christian. And therefore, he started persecuting Christians, what we will call a genocide today. Peter himself was martyred, actually, during this period, as well as Apostle Paul, together with Apostle Paul, actually. Uh, Peter wrote 1 Peter and 2 Peter, the first, two let- uh, the first letter and the second letter of P- uh, Peter, before he was martyred. And his primary purpose for writing the first letter was to encourage the persecuted uh, Christians who are facing persecution. Now today, although our lives are not in danger for our faith, we should not take that for granted because many people worldwide live in danger because of their faith in Christ. Peter's primary purpose in writing 1 Peter was to encourage the persecuted to stay strong and to walk in Hope, despite their sufferings, trials, and persecutions. This we covered last week. We look at walking in hope of the glory of God. This week, we will look at walking in holiness amid a world full of troubles and temptations. I will dwell on the word holy and or holiness today. This passage presents an excellent uh, opportunity for us to look at this uh, holy, this word holy or holiness. Because holiness, right, is increasingly missing. You think about it, it's actually increasing missing in our Christian conversation and our Christian conduct today. We are becoming either more casual and careless with our faith or more judgmental and legalistic with our faith and not helped by the world bombarding us with different worldviews and lifestyles that discredit or undermine or reject God making it harder to stay true to our faith making it harder to remain as a Christian here Peter shifts to this whole idea of holy living around uh, verses 15 and 16. 
But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy because I am holy. He challenges the Christians being persecuted then and us today to believe that as the Lord called you is holy, you, we, must also be holy in our conduct. Uh, in uh, NIV, it says, in all that you do. Highlight the word, all that you do. Okay, uh, Because this, this word do carries the meaning of conduct, lifestyle, way of life. And this begs the question of what and how to live a holy lifestyle. Peter begins this letter section with the conjunction, therefore, to link the preceding verses and what follows. The preceding verses, the prior context highlights the believer's new birth, born again, yeah? new birth, inheritance and salvation through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. Now, this is the grace of God. This is what God did and what God will do. What about us? What part do we play? Therefore, Peter says, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, Preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded means be self-controlled. Set your mind fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Set your mind fully on the grace to be given to you, another version, is to be given to you when Jesus Christ is revealed on that day. The word preparing, in Greek it means to gird up, G-I-R-D, to gird up. In much of the East, Eastern world, uh, at a point in time, men, they wear long ropes, yeah? And they would tuck the long ropes into uh, their belt and girding up their waist so they could move freely and they could run. Now, this imagery of being prepared, a state of alertness and readiness would have been very obvious uh, to folks at that point in time. And also to some people group, even today, especially uh, uh, in the Middle East, yeah? So, today, such action, right? Girding up, right? Uh, we will call or we will say, roll up our sleeves and be ready, right? This is our responsibility. This is the part that we play. Remember that I mentioned, life is short, enjoy it. Eternal life is long, so you better prepare for it. Don't wait till Jesus comes. When he comes, it will be judgment call and not a call to repentance. It may be too late. Either grace be given to you or not. So be prepared, be alert and be ready for action today. And we need to be ready for action today because, you know, living in a, a, a holy uh, way of life today is actually rather tricky and um, complicated. Our world is a complicated world, yeah? Although we may not experience martyrdom uh, like those early Christians, there is always, in this world, right now, there's always a tension, a growing tension facing us every day. There is an increasing skepticism toward grand narratives or overarching truths in the world today. The world is constantly changing. It's in a flux since the beginning of time and history. And, and one thing for sure, the voice of humanity today, voices of postmodernism, voices of post-truth are getting viral. Social media and all that are getting viral, louder. The voices are louder, more immersive and growing in social acceptance. Both Postmodernism and post truth era today challenge the notion of absolute truth or universal meaning of truth. Truth to them is relative. Truth in the world is relative. It is subjective. Why? Because it is a social construct. It's dependent on who 
say the truth, who make the truth. Truth is what I feel, I think it is true. What works for me today or the world? We are bombarded with these alternatives every day without exception. At work, church, workplace, schools and society at large. Widening the chasm, the, the, the gulf that we have between God and man. Uh, between us and our sovereign creator. And man, humanity, becoming more desensitized to the absolute truth found in the word given to us by God. Therefore, it is critical. It is critical. It is a matter of life and death actually for us that we remain true to our faith and beliefs and anchor ourselves onto the one who is our hope, who's... That's why Peter say, set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. The grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We have got to pin our hope in Jesus Christ. Now hope and, hope and holiness, they are the same word. Eh? They, 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 they go together actually. For all who have this hope in Christ purify themselves just as Christ is pure. 1 John 3.3 3. The Greek word for holy is hagios and it can mean two things. To be set apart for God. To be set apart for God and to live morally pure to God. The Bible uses these two words in both ways actually. In one sense, is what God does for you and me, what God does for us. In the other is how we conduct ourselves. When you and I are saved, that is to say, when you and I enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ by faith in what He did on the cross, we are instantly set apart. We are instantly saved. We are instantly set apart. We are made holy. Now that is the work of God. That is grace. That is not anything that we can do ourselves. God makes us holy and so in that sense, we are set apart. Set apart means distinct or, or set apart is also distinct. Uh, it is also different and we have a different purpose. Once we are saved, we are set apart, we, are, we have a different purpose. We have been transformed through the faith in Christ. So, God makes us holy. But then scripture also calls us to be holy. To walk in holiness and to conduct ourselves in a way that is honorable, in a way that is pleasing and morally pure to God, not to the world, to God. Therefore, Hagios is both positional and practical in the Bible. Backtrack a little bit. When I say holy to God, not to the world, means our standard is God's standard and not world standard. Yeah? So, Hagios is both positional. God makes us holy. That's positional. Yeah? And God calls us to be holy. That is practical living. Okay? We are made holy by trusting in Christ as our Savior. But we are also challenged to live a life of holiness. And Peter, the first thing he highlights in holy living is we are not to conform to the world. Non-conformity to the world. He says in verse 14, 15, As absolute children, do not conform to the evil desires you had, you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. After becoming Christians and committing ourselves to be Christ followers, we, we will still feel a pullback actually. We will still feel a pullback uh, to our always, from our old self. In this verse, Apostle Paul urges Christians to avoid conforming when under stress and under pressure from the world, avoid conforming to our former evil desires when we were not believers. The evil desires that Peter mentions uh, here, that 
Peter mentioned here, um, are actually a product of the worldly system characterized by sin and ignorance. Basically, the dominant culture and value system of the world, which is opposed to God's ways. He emphasizes the importance of living a life that is obedient to God and His commands and not being influenced by the sinful patterns of behavior of the world that characterizes yours and mine, our previous way of life. Paul gives a similar appeal in Romans 12 verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So he calls us not to conform to the pattern of this world, meaning to walk in holiness, to be people set apart, constantly changing thought patterns and attitudes to be more like Christ and less like the world. Now this calls for obedience. And this obedience is not rooted in legalism, you know, following to-do list or anything like that, or a desire for control, okay? It has got to be this way, it has got to be that way, okay? It's not motivated by all this, but rather the motivation should be, it is found in verse 15, the recognition that God who has called us, He Himself is holy and therefore we must strive to be holy in all that we do. We live out of our being, our identity in Christ, being transformed to be more and more Christ-like from inside out and not outside in. Peter doesn't expand on what holiness looks like exactly other than what seems to be a guiding principle or truth. Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. But doesn't scripture tell us uh, what to believe exactly and what to do? The scripture does tell us that. However, it is the whole counsel of the Bible, the word, tells you what to believe and what to do. Peter directs, <coughs> Peter directs us back to the word of God. It's the whole counsel uh, of God. As seen in uh, verse 16, For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. For it is written, Peter is directing us back to uh, the word. And it is in the word that we find and we learn what holy living looks like. Now to explain holiness and how to be holy, uh, we need to actually look at um, the word, the Bible, because that's where the standards is. That's where we find exactly how we can live out a holy life. Specifically, this verse here, for it is written, be holy because I'm holy, Peter is quoting actually from Leviticus. Leviticus 20, 26, God sets apart His people for His purpose. Okay, uh, it is said here, be holy because I am holy. So in uh, Leviticus 20, God is saying that you are to be holy for God's purpose. Leviticus 19, verse 2, where God uh, gave Moses various uh, ethical and moral laws to be given to the Israelites by God through Moses. Here, it sets forth his standards and conduct. The chapter, the whole uh, Leviticus 19, emphasizes the holiness of God and the call for his people to conform and reflect the holiness in their everyday lives through righteous living and obedience to his commandments. However, many practices, as stated in uh, Leviticus, are no longer relevant for, uh, for the post-Christ ascension uh, Christians uh, to whom Peter was actually addressing. And to us today, for example, in Leviticus 19, it says uh, it prohibit, prohibits uh, wearing clothes made of two kinds of fabric. But now, all the clothes that you're wearing, the fabrics are all, all mixed, right? Uh, wool and cotton and whatever not, they are all mixed. Okay, if we are to follow that rule today, we are not supposed to wear a lot of the clothes that you're wearing. 
Okay, it cannot be mixed. Leviticus 19, 5 to 8 describes offering sacrifices for atonement or gratitude with animal and blood of animal and all that. It may have spiritual significance at that point in time, but it is not practiced today. Why? Because Jesus Christ has taken on to be our perfect sacrifice for the atonement of our sins. I believe in directing us to the word here, for it is written, Peter is urging us to seek the counsel of the whole Bible to live a holy life, not just uh, to be taken from uh, Leviticus alone. The context may have changed since then until today, but God's character remains unchanged. His word remains evergreen, and His spiritual principles never vary even as the world changes. What does the scripture say to us about being holy? For it is written, be holy because I am holy. And holy means distinctly different, set apart from the world. You know, the world will mark us out to be different. Once you say you're Christian and you live a Christian life, the world will know and the world will mark us out to be different. We have seen the oppressions and the persecutions of early believers endure at the hands of the world because uh, they were different, right? So Jesus actually prayed. Jesus actually prayed in uh, John 17, 16. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. They, as in you and I, are not of the world, even as Jesus is not of the world. It's from here that we get this saying, we may be living in the world, but we are not of the world. Suffering inflicted upon us by others do not justify, okay? Do not justify us doing the same thing in return. How others treat you reflects who they are. How you react or respond um, reflects who you are. And who are we? We are children of Christ, of God, right? We are to be uh, different. We are set apart and we are to be different in Christ. We are to be holy, for Jesus Christ is holy. Set apart to be like Jesus. Now, the Bible, uh, like I say, uh, does not always provide us with the do's and the don'ts. Okay? Uh, something like a list for us to follow for holy living. And I do not intend to do that. Okay? This is not what I want to start uh, doing. Providing us with the uh, a holy to-do list um, and and risk uh, turning faith into a ritual or formula. You know, in the Bible, you may find specific verses, passages, action steps from the Bible in your time of need. In the Bible, often, what we find is actually guiding principle of God's truth applicable in all circumstances. So the question about how to live a holy life in this world could be better answered if we restate this question to be, how holy is my life? How different, how much of set apart is my life? Remember the meaning of holy is a set apart or different, right? Am I living a life no different from others? Especially those who don't know God, making it less likely for them to want to know God because I look no different from them. Is that your life? If people are less likely to, be, to see a difference in you, in me, that will cause them to be curious about my faith, then I am looking too much like them. I am living too much like them. I am talking too much like they do. And I am going to places too much like they go. I am too much like the world. No different from the world, then it cannot be said, I am living a holy life. Living a holy life means interacting and relating to each other in such a way, yeah, differently from, uh, different from how the world does it. How different? Be holy, for I am holy. God didn't say, the word didn't say, be holy like that pastor. Be holy like that leader. Be holy like, like your parent. Be holy like your friend. But the word say, be holy for I am holy. 
God is the standard in defining holiness, not our terms, not our character. It means our thoughts, our words and actions ought to reflect the character of Jesus Christ with qualities like compassion, kindness, grace, mercy, love, generosity, etc. By exhibiting these qualities, we can positively impact those around us, pointing them and leading them toward God, toward the Word. This is what holy living entails. Living in holiness sets apart from the crowd for Jesus Christ. Living life exuding Jesus, His holiness, that others may be drawn to Him or may deepen their relationship with God. This is conforming to the Word, for the Word is Jesus. Let's look at some examples from Scripture. I will point to you two passages illustrating how we live or exude a holy life as an example. The first passage is from Romans 14, uh, 19 to, verse 19 to 21. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. In the first century, Christians faced a dilemma regarding whether to eat or not to eat meat offered to idols. And meat being offered to idols is a, is a common practice uh, in the Roman culture. Paul's message in Romans 14 here emphasizes considering others' well-being over personal freedom, personal liberty. He advises that while eating such meat is permissible, why is it permissible? All things are from God. You give thanks before you eat, you eat. Yeah, that, that is, there's not, nothing wrong with that. Yeah? One should refrain. One should refrain if it could cause another person to stumble or be offended. Look at the second passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 to 33. I'm not going to read the whole passage. Um, now, it is a theme just like the illustration in Romans 14, but it gives a little bit more detail. I will paraphrase the 11 verses instead of reading the whole passage. Okay, here in this passage, right, Paul talks about how believers should use their personal freedom, personal liberty in Christ. He emphasizes that not everything good is beneficial. Not everything good is beneficial and that we should not seek our good, our own good, but the good of others. He encourages us to eat whatever is sold in the marketplace without asking questions of conscience. An example of a meat offered to idols would be uh, the kind of food that is being sold in the marketplace. If someone, if someone tells us that the meat was sacrificed to the idols, we should not eat it for the sake of their conscience, for the sake of their good. Yeah? If it will cause them to stumble, even though it is alright to eat um, uh, meat offered to idols after giving thanks, we should not eat for the sake of their conscience. Reading the last three verses, uh, verses 31 to 33. So, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God. Everyone, believers and non-believers, do not cause them to stumble. Even as I try to please everyone in every way, for I am not seeking my good. I'm not seeking my good here is saying, I'm not trying to seek my good. I'm not trying to exercise the right that I have, my right, yeah? But the good of many, so that they may be saved. What Paul is saying here in a nutshell is that I should never live just for myself. Every single one of us needs to live with two things in mind. Very important, two things in mind. Okay, number one, does this glorify God? And number two, how does this impact others? Does it bring them closer to God? Does it deepen their relationship with God? We don't live Christ 
we don't live Christ for ourselves only to exhibit our holiness. No. We live Christ. We don't live Christ for ourselves only, our holiness or even our purposes or our agenda or our desires or our fulfillment. We don't live Christ for ourselves. Remember the great commandment of Jesus Christ to love God and to love neighbor, to love man. Yeah? We are therefore to live our lives for the glory of God and in consideration of other people. You first, me second. You first, me second. That they may be saved. Or that they may continue to be being saved. The two illustrations remind us that personal freedoms or liberty should not come at the expense of God's glory or cause believers to stumble in their faith, or non-believers to reject our faith. Don't turn personal uh, uh, God-given freedom or liberty into a personal individual right that becomes your idol in life and becomes a stumbling block to other people. So, as believers, brothers and sisters in Christ, you and I, we have influence. We are influencers, no? You know, those influencers? We are influencers. We have influence. The question then becomes, is our influence glorifying God? Is our influence something that helps people to either come to Christ or closer in their relationship with Christ? The two questions. Very important question. Or does my influence cause um, them to somehow stumble or take offense? and they may even reject the faith. We are called to set good examples and to be godly influencers. And I think the only way Christians, you and I, will be effective influencers in the world today, in the world, troubled world that we live in, is if we take the subject of holiness, holy living, holiness seriously and ask ourselves, Whatever we do, whatever we say, whatever we think, is it glorifying God? Is this leading others to Christ or edifying those who already know Jesus Christ? It is, is, is this how, this is how, okay, this is how we are being challenged in relationships back here in 1 Timothy, back here in today's passage. To be, to be obedient children, not conforming to this world, not living our lives according to the pattern or the dominant culture of this world, not conforming to um, my own personal likes, dislikes or my own personal rights, but conforming to the word, living a holy life sanctified in Christ regardless of what the world throws at you. Now listen, the world will constantly try to shape you into its image through misinformation, disinformation, through defilement, through deception, through division, and through encouragement. But the Bible calls us to live so that we are shaped in the image of our Savior. Romans 8.29, For those God foreknew, you and I, Christians, for those God foreknew, He predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. We are to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Paul reiterates in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 7, For God did not call us to be impure, to be like the world. Yeah, God calls us to set us apart from the world. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. That is, walking in holiness, morally pure and set apart from the world for the glory of God. In addition to striving to live holy lives and reflect the image of Christ, we are also reminded in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, the last uh, four verses, verses 17 to 21, last four verses of today. Um, yeah, Peter, in these uh, verses, right, Peter reminds us that God is an impartial judge who will judge each person's works fairly. Now, judgment here is not about salvation. Eh? It is about us giving account of our work when we are before Jesus Christ or when we are before God. 
As believers, we should strive to live holy lives that reflect the image of Christ and use our time on earth wisely. To do good, to love one another deeply and to build up our fellow human beings to faith and in faith. Let us be mindful that as believers, we have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus and will be judged based on our actions. This obedience will not pass unnoticed by God. May we always aim to please God and love one another deeply and sincerely with the love of God so that our works may be found pleasing in His sight. Now, brothers and sisters, we can still lead a holy life in a world of troubles, sin, and death. This morning, we woke up to the news of what's happening or the development that's happening in the Middle East. Yeah, um, What do you do with that? Thank God for us, we can still come back this morning into this century, into the presence of God, into His Word, and worship Him and glorify Him. For He is a holy God. And we thank God for that, yeah? We can still live a holy life in a world of troubles, sin and death. Now, to do so, we need to distance ourselves from the impurities of the world. Distance not as in, you know, we go to some cave in Timbuktu and hide ourselves from the world, okay? It's not that. Different as in, we mustn't be like them. We mustn't be like them with impurities. We need to be pure, right? Remember, the verse says uh, we have been put through fire and we are pure, yeah? So, we, we, we are able to, um, we need to distance ourselves from the impurities of the world and also our actions need to be guided by these two questions. Do they glorify God? Does it draw uh, others closer to God? This is how we maintain a holy life a blameless life while living in a polluted world. How, um, how you and I can remain to be that sunshine in a gloomy weather. We must remember the power we hold and the difference we can make. We honour our faith by staying true to God's standards and striving to glorify Him in all that we do. And also, we become catalysts for change in the lives of the people we touch or people whom God brought into our midst to touch. Let's passionately embrace this call to holiness or holy living. Let's talk about it. Let's keep talking about it and let's keep living it out. Reflecting God's grace and inspiring others to pursue holiness in a world that desperately, that desperately needs it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your word and the call to pursue holiness. We pray that our pursuit of holiness will not only bring glory to your name, but also serve as a means of pointing others to you, deepening our relationship with you. May we exude the holiness of Christ in all that we think, we do, speak, and inspire, and inspire others to Christ to pursue holiness and to glorify your holy name. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for the great reminder. As we sing the standing hymn, Glorify Thy Name, let's rise and remind ourselves that our life, we need to glorify His name.
Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. Now, uh, first things first, are there any visitors here that I don't have? Huh? Okay, or khakis. Now, first things first, like to every one of us here to extend to each other the holy greeting. We all, we all read about the holy kiss in the Bible, right? Now, I'm going to share with you the holy greetings. Okay, what is the holy greeting? Come. Okay, uh, that kind of like warms us, us, right? Yeah. Okay, just a, just a, just a one or two announcement. Um, okay, so the, the bulletin is here, the hard copy bulletin today, uh, out from the press a little bit late, but if you need, uh, you, uh, you can uh, just uh, pick it up uh, on the way out. Um, in, the, in the bulletin, I actually also have an insert, which you can see. Um, in your e-bulletin. Okay, so the insert is about starting the day with God. How we can start the day with God. Basically, how do we uh, say good morning to God? Yeah, so I put down some steps there just as a guide to help us along. And as we pray, uh, the, the five-finger prayer uh, uh, framework is also there. Um, the feedback was the last week's one. The tiny words is a bit too small. Uh, my bad, I'm sorry, but uh, hopefully this time around will be bigger, yeah, so you can refer to the inside, inside. it's still small, but then, you know, look at the, the digital version, you can actually make it very big, lah, huh? okay, so, okay, so that's uh, the e-bulletin, uh, next, next week, um, in, it will be an interesting uh, Sunday, uh, I've invited uh, Pastor Peng, who will be here to deliver the message uh, to us, talking about uh, serving God, set free to serve yeah to serve god and to serve each other and after that um you know we have uh, just finished the book of acts uh, first 12 chapters right and one of the key learning from that first 12 chapters is really uh, the core of christian and the core of uh, the church is to serve the world and to witness christian faith in word and deeds yeah now the world really is uh, quite broken it's very much a uh, trouble yeah and the world needs the word of god and though and and this uh, broken troubled world can be healed with the power of the divine word now this does not happen only uh you know um only by preaching teaching or just simply us reading the bible but by participating in the mission of god this can be achieved by us participating in the mission of God. Because mission of God is actually the word of God. It's also the work of God. And we can be part of uh, his work. And therefore, next week, I have actually... Next week, I, I have actually uh, invited uh, missionary pastor John Wong and his wife, Tomomi, uh, both missionaries in Japan, uh, they have been doing mission work for more than 10 years, the last 20 years or so, uh, to come to share with us what God is doing in Japan, which is a, a hard ground actually, and also to share with us uh, God's call for them to reach out uh, to the lost in Japan. Their experience uh, so far and also their plan ahead. They will be returning to Japan uh, for the work uh, this time around to the north of Japan uh, for the mission work in uh, June. So do come and listen uh, to them. Uh, next week, uh, 
during the CE hour actually. Yeah? And as a church, we can pray. We can pray and we can decide uh, what we would like to, how and in what way we can be part of God's work. God is working in Japan for the, in the recent years there's this Love Japan movement going on. So a lot of resources, missionaries, prayers has been directed, uh, has been going there. Yeah? And who knows, we can be part of what God is doing, uh, big and amazing things over there. God's work. We can be part of God's work in Japan. Just like how we partner and think about how we can partner uh, both uh, Pastor John and uh, Tomomi and just like how we can uh, pa- uh, how we partner with uh, Podi and Hatis, yeah, whom we prayed earlier on. Okay? So, uh, come uh, after service, uh, during the sea hour, come and listen to them. Yeah? Okay. Um, the next after fellowship today, 11 to 11.30, we're going to have our family prayer. So do come join us uh, for half an hour of uh, family prayer, praying for one another, praying for the church and praying for the world. Okay, so let us rise uh, for the benediction. May Almighty God make you faithful to His calling, cheerful in His service, and fruitful for His kingdom. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and through you with all those to whom He sends you now and always. Amen.